I'm Ann Bocock, and welcome to Between the Covers. Lisa C. is the New York Times best-selling author of so many books. She's known for her deeply researched historical novels. Her latest book is set on a remote Korean island, and it introduces us to an unforgettable culture of free diving females. The women are in danger, the women do the hard work, and the men stay at home and take care of the children. It's a story that spans generations, it spans wars, and it's a story of survival. Please welcome the author of The Island of Sea Women, Lisa C. Thank you for having me. I am so glad that you are here. And first of all, I'm transfixed by this story because here we are, you have dropped me, first of all, into a place I didn't know anything about. So before we get into your book and the novel, I think we need to take a step back, look at the Henyo women and the island of Jeju. Where is it? So it's off the tip of South Korea, about 100 miles off the tip. And it's also about 100 miles from China and 100 miles from Japan. So for um, thousands of years, it was its own independent kingdom. But now it's part of South Korea. And then the Henyo, that means sea women. These are women who are unique in the world. As you mentioned, they dive down, they take deep breaths, they dive down about 60 feet. They stay underwater two to three minutes, holding their breath. They harvest seafood. And as you said, they're the breadwinners in their families, and the men are the ones who do the, you know, stay home and take care of the babies, do the cooking. This is a, a matrifocal society. society, which means that it is, it focuses on women and children. Right. So in this particular society, let's look at the gender roles and what is it like for the men? Well, the men, it's kind of an interesting thing because they're supposed to take care of the babies, but their other main job is to sit and think under the village tree. So Somebody so, has to do that. Somebody okay. has to do the thinking, right? And so they sit and think, but, but um, you know, this actually sort of culturally has been difficult for the men over the many centuries. But these women, you know, I really focus on them because they are so extraordinary in the world um, and their number is dwindling. So it used to be that they would retire at age 55. If they lived that long, it's extraordinarily dangerous Very work. Very dangerous. Uh, but today there are under 4,000 of them left. The youngest one is 55. And when I was there, I interviewed women in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, most of whom were still diving. What is their relationship with the sea? And, and metaphorically, I, I read the book, I love the book. Sometimes I think the sea is like their mother, sometimes I think it's like their husband, but, but I don't want to tell you, so Well, they do say, they do have a lot of proverbs that are things like, you know, the sea is better than your mother because it's there forever. Uh, but at the same time, it is a dangerous place for them. So one of the aphorisms is, every woman who goes into the sea carries a coffin on her back. Mm -hmm. And so they're very aware of, of the bounty that comes from the sea, but also the danger that's inherent there. And, you know, all of the things that can go wrong, you could get your hair caught in a rock, you could get a tool caught, you could, it's a volcanic island, so it's very sharp volcanic rocks, and you could cut yourself, they're sharks. Um, you get, could get tangled in seaweed or fishing lines. And of course, there is this whole issue of breath. And I've timed myself, I'd sort of encourage everyone watching this to just, just for fun, to time yourself, to see how long you can hold your breath. And I'm not very good at it. Well, I don't think we could. And not only no. hold your breath, you're fighting the current the while current, you're holding exactly. your breath. Exactly. And, you know, let's say maybe you're just an average diver. You can hold your breath for two minutes. But maybe last night you didn't sleep well. Maybe you had an argument with your husband. Maybe you were worried about a child. And so you might be underwater harvesting a sea urchin or gathering up whatever, you know, abalone, different kinds of things. And all of a sudden, on this day, you only have a minute and 45 seconds. And now you're still 20 feet under the surface of the water, and what do you do? Not only is it 
is it extraordinary that the, it's frightening as when I'm reading these passages of what these women are doing it's scaring the you know I know I'm laughing <laughs> <laughs> yes it's scary and you, you said it's a volcanic island the rocks are so dangerous and it's not always clear no no yeah the rocks are dangerous so the uh, the volcano itself is called grandmother solman day this is the the sort of the the embodiment of the mother creator of the island part of this island being a matrifocal society is that it's home to 10,000 goddesses the gods are you know they're very lesser. They're, they're <laughs> lesser. They're consorts, and so this this the island itself is a goddess. And so they, what you know, because it's volcanic, there are these the the lava has flowed under sea, and the women describe it as flowing flowing and swimming through Grandmother Solman Day's skirts when they're working. That's actually very beautiful. Yeah. I, I'm curious if this is a, I know they've passed this down generation to generation. Is this something that is learned or is there something genetic that these women are capable of doing this in cold water and, right. and to hold their breath for this long? Yeah, let's just talk about the cold water for one second. They do have the greatest ability of any human group on earth to withstand cold. So historically they would dive in the waters off of Japan, Korea, uh, China, Russia, Russia, off the coast of Vladivostok in winter with just a little homemade cotton suit. We're not I mean, talking a wetsuit. No, there's just this little, and there are stories of women diving off the boat and, di and dying on impact because the cold was such a shock. But for this reason, they are known to have this great ability. And so there were scientists who came in the 1960s to try to figure out, is this genetic or is it an adaptation? And if you read to about page 300, yes. you're going to find out the answer. Exactly. You are the queen of research. I think you absolutely <clears throat> love it. And I'm not talking the kind that you Google. You no. go everywhere. I think if I remember correctly, and I don't remember which book it was, you were like the second For stranger. For Snowflower in The Secret Fan, I was only the second foreigner to go there. What was that like? Well, you know, it's really... And where was this? This, this was, was in southwestern um, Yunnan province. It's called Jianyang County. It's a very, very remote area. It was really remote then. It's still remote now. Um, and the thing about going to places that are that remote, you know, you're, you're really cut off from the rest of the world. There's not a lot of television and things like that. But they have incredible food sometimes, and sometimes you just have to eat what they give you. And um, I've had to eat some pretty interesting things so, <laughs> over the <bet>. years. <laughs> and, uh, but with Jeju Island, this if people like sushi or things like that, we, one of the fun things to do is just to walk on the beach as these women come out of the sea. And they'll just tip over a bucket, and you sit on the bucket, and they'll open um, a sea urchin and, and give it to you with a spoon. They just, it's literally, you know, minutes from being brought out of the sea and it's extraordinary. What are they diving for? It's mostly things, you know, that are in shells. So turbine shell, abalone, um, sea urchin, but also octopus, also different types of seaweed and algae. So, you know, agar agar is something in so many of our packaged foods, for example, they, they die for agar agar. During World War II, the Japanese who had control over this island told the women they could no longer dive for food. They could only dive for a particular kind of algae because it's an ingredient in um, gunpowder. That was, that, that was fascinating. Yeah. When you went to Jeju, were the women receptive? Well, what I love about these women is they're very blunt. <laughs> they're really okay. blunt. And I think that's partly because they face life and death every single mm -hmm. day. So if they want to talk to you, they'll sit down. You know, if they don't want to talk to you, they'll say, oh, I'm so busy. Go away. <laughs> Go away. And they're quite loud because they've spent their entire lives under the sea. So their hearing is really off. So they shout. They oh, banter. Oh, it, it affects their hearing. It, it does. And they banter. They love to tell jokes. Uh, one of the big things they talk about all the time and so funny is, you know, who should eat more, men or women? And? Well, I think it's women in that case. Well, they're, they're using all the calories up, so they, do, right. they need, need to replenish. When you were writing, were you constantly aware of what you were writing 
as an era that is probably going to be lost very soon. Very much. They say that this culture is going to disappear in about 15 years. And so that was part of the reason why I wanted to write this now. If I waited five years, if I waited 10 years, I might not really get the chance to, you know, certainly those women who are in their 90s, I wouldn't have a chance to interview them. And I think they're also very much aware that their culture is disappearing. One of the things that happened in the late 1970s was this was the first time, and just think about this, the first time that girls in South Korea could go to public school. And so all of these women are illiterate. But in the late 1970s, they started saving up their money so that they could send their daughters and granddaughters to school. And those daughters and granddaughters became doctors and engineers and work in tourism and things like that. But that's part of why this is disappearing. And that's just over <clears throat> the last 40 years. Right. Was there a particular woman, a particular event that just moved you when you were there? Yes. Uh, so I had a lot of appointments set up to meet different women, but I also just loved going and walking along the beach and talking to them. And there does come a point where a lot of women do retire. They stay out of the sea, or maybe they have an injury. And so... But they're 90 years old anyway. They, right. Okay. Yeah, or in their late 80s. And so I would just walk along the beach, and they, what they do is they have these little cushions. They tie them to their rear ends. They sit on their cushion with their, their knees kind of up around their ears, and they sort algae. And so I would just walk up to women and talk to them. And their stories were incredible. You know, I would... I remember this one woman, she, she, you know, again, they love to brag. You know, I was the best henyo. I was so good under the water, I can even cook a meal under there. <laughs> <laughs> this book, The Island of Sea Women, spans decades. I mean, I, there's parts in the 30s, the 40s, and many wars. Yeah. Uh, we, we are talking World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam. All of this has had an enormous impact mm -hmm. on this island and these women. Now, generally, when I read your books, and I do love your books, I, I don't want to be bothered. I just want to sit here and read, and, and I read till the end. Well, I got to a turning point in this book that, right. that we will talk about, and I literally had to close the book and let this wash over me and, and process this because it was so horrifying and it was foreign to me. Right. We're talking about 1948. Yes. There is what they call the incident. The 4-3 incident the stands fourth, for it doesn't April even have a name. 3. Well, it's for April 3rd. So 4-3. And this is at a time, you know, the uh, Japanese colonialism is over, World War II is over, um, Russia and the United States have divided Korea. They didn't get a say in it. And now the United States says, we want to let you have your own free elections. However, we chose the candidate who did end up becoming quite a brutal dictator. But the people of South Korea, they, wanted to they did want to have their own free elections. They did want to have their own candidates. And so there were demonstrations, and things started to escalate. And then on this island, it really ended up that on April 3rd, 1948, is the beginning of a massacre that takes place over this island over the course of eight years. How many people? It's between 30 and 80,000 people were killed. And this is a tiny, tiny island. Tiny island. 80,000 people became refugees. 40,000 escaped to Japan. 70% of all of the villages and houses were destroyed. So this was just a terrible thing. And... Uh, people, everyone lost someone, but then to compound the shock and the, and the tragedy of it, the Korean government didn't allow people to talk about this for 50 years. That's what got me. Yeah. I thought, how did you do this research? Because it was taboo to even talk about right. it. Right. Well, finally now, today, this island is considered an island of peace. And so for the last 10 years, they really and internationally looked at it as an island of peace. Uh, and work towards this idea of forgiveness. But of course, you do need two sides to forgive, I mean, to be part of an act of forgiveness. Was it particularly challenging for you to write what we're talking about? Very. Well, I never wake up in the morning and think, woo I get to kill off whoever. You know, I, it, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. very hard for me. And 
you know, I am the writer, so I know what's coming, you know, and sometimes a couple of months out, I start to kind of like, okay, I've got to prepare myself for this. And I think one of the, you know, we're so lucky in this country that we live where and when we do, that we haven't had a war on our soil since the Civil War and before that, the Revolutionary War. So we don't really have that day-to-day -day day experience after another, after another. of what that means. Mm -hmm. And I, I just wanted to honor for them what had happened. But the other piece of this is these are two best friends for life. And what happens to people when they are put in this most extraordinary circumstance? You know, are we the kind of people who would, we'd like to think we would be loyal and honorable and rise to the occasion? But in real life, you know, that often doesn't happen, that people uh, to save themselves, to save others, will betray somebody. Um, and so to, I think for me, almost more than writing about the massacre per se, it's really about these interpersonal relationships oh, yes. between Meja and Yong Suk and their families. But let's talk about the uh, female friendships for a moment because you're really, really a master uh -huh. at this. Like, uh, Snowflower and the Secret right. Fan, we, we had the best friends best for friends. life. Right? We have best friends here. Is it just that women's friendships are messier and more complicated and much more fun to write about than men? Well, I think there are two pieces to that. First of all, we have centuries of men writing about women and not very many women writing about our own relationships. Um, yes, you can go back and you'll find the Bronte sisters and Jane Austen and Virginia Woolf, but you know, it's really only the last 75 years that women have really been writing and publishing and talking about our own lives and the kinds of relationships we have. So I'm always drawn to sisters, to mothers and daughters, and of course to best friends. And you will tell a best friend something that you wouldn't tell your husband or your boyfriend Absolutely. or your lover or um, your children or your mother. It's a very particular kind of intimacy. And when you have that, and when you have that vulnerability, that also leaves you open to be hurt. And I think of this as kind of like the dark shadow side of female friendship. And I just dive right into those shadows. And, and you're so good at it. This book progresses in an interesting way. In the very beginning, there's no electricity, there's no running water, they've got to go far away to, to bring right. women, the women are doing this, bringing the, the jugs of water back to, to do whatever. At the end of the story, they've got iPhones and they've right. got um, the, the ear, Airpo ear pods. Mm -hmm. So what do you think that they, in modernization, that they've gained and what have they lost? Well, so it is interesting that today Korea is one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. It's super, super modern. And yet that all happened in this very short period of time. And so I think whenever you have this, this kind of geometric jump, there's, there's so much that is gained. You know, just for example, washing machines you know, and how transformative a washing machine is to women's lives around the world. Um, to have access to television and radio that gives you a sense of not only what's happening where you live, but it also about your country, about the rest of the world. So all of that is great, but you do start to lose traditions um, and you do start to lose, I think, some of those um, traditions that really keep families together that are, are so deep, that, but they start to get diffused a little bit. And that's always hard on a culture. It really is. The Henyu women were very interesting because truly they were financially independent. Mm -hmm. They had their own thing going. Now, how is it now, because you, you, you were there not that long right. ago, they've always passed this down from one generation right. to another. Are they happy that their daughters now are would be Going they're out in so the world, happy. Or are they, they are. No, they're so proud of their daughters and granddaughters. I mean, this, this again, it's very dangerous work. It's very hard work. Uh, and so they wanted the best for their children, you know, and to give their daughters, especially, this different life. And, and you know, just to be able to read and write and how important that is to all of us, 
But for these women, you know, all of the ones because that the I interviewed. Because the boys did go to school. The boys went to school. But, and then they would talk about, you know, who do you want to marry? Do you want to marry the doctor? Do you want to marry yeah. Peter? And this is something that still today, you know, continues to today. I loved it. I just loved that Heidi was in there. Can we talk about your background for a moment? Because that really is, is in all of your books. Mm -hmm. You are from a mixed background, mm -hmm. Chinese American. And how did, did that affect your writing? How did that Absolutely. affect your writing? So when I was a child, I mean, I, in Los Angeles, where I grew up, I have about 400 relatives. There are about a dozen that look like me. Family reunions must yeah. be fun. Okay. <laughs> the, the majority are still full Chinese and then this little spectrum in between. And so when I was a little girl and I looked around me, what I saw were Chinese faces, what I experienced was Chinese culture, Chinese tradition, Chinese language, Chinese food. And so that's why I write the kinds of books I do, even though I don't look Chinese at all. But this is what I experienced <laughs> as a girl and all the way to today. Talk a little bit about your Chinese history, if you would. So my great-great-great-grandfather -grand came to work on the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. My great-grandfather came and stayed, and he was in Sacramento. He did a lot of the jobs that immigrants do even today. He washed dishes in restaurants. He swept up in the factories. He worked in fields. I don't know if I can say this, but by the time he was 30 in the 1880s, in Sacramento, he had his first business. It was a factory that manufactured crotchless underwear for brothels. <laughs> Talk about coming a long oh, way yes, here. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Every, everyone has to have their beginning in America. That's ours. I like that. Yes. Would you? Could we do a little lightning round? Sure. Would you? Okay. Um, I know that you have traveled extensively and to crazy remote parts of the world. Your favorite place you've ever been? Bhutan. And I'm going to say why, because most of us have not been. Well, it, first of all, it, it, it's considered to be the happiest place on earth. Yeah. Uh, they ha it's you know a landlocked country. It, it, they only accept a few visitors every year, about 10,000. Now I think it's a little more. And so they, they, the <laughs> king makes sure that the architecture remains the you know traditional. If you don't follow the actual architecture, they won't hook up electricity oh. <laughs> into your house. So it's still very authentic. I think they don't have a single um, traffic light. They don't have a single Starbucks. They won't let any oh. chains like that into the country. So it's still so pure uh, of its own culture. Do you write every day? When, when, when you're when not traveling? I'm writing, when I'm writing, I try to write a thousand words a day, which is four pages. But actually, the writing is the, le the shortest amount of time for my work. So a book takes me two years. The largest amount is focused on the research. The shortest is writing, and the middle part is the editing. So if you're writing a, you know, a thousand words a day, that's four pages. I think the last book was about 400 pages. That's only 100 days. If you could not have been a writer, what would you have been? Landscape architect. I like that. Worst job? Worst job, I was, um, <laughs> what do you call like the PBX person? Okay. Oh, a, a, a telephone. Like, like the, the, hello, uh, you know, the name of the company, how my, how my director called. Bing, bing, you know. Not much creativity in No, in, in, no in windows that in that, all. no windows in that room either. When you are not writing, I know you are probably reading. What is it that you like to read? I actually don't read fiction when I'm working because I don't want anybody else's voice to seep in, even inadvertently. I'm very careful about what I read. And, and I know this may be kind of superstitious. Uh, it's sort of like you know, the quarterback saying, I'm going to wear the same jock strap all season uh -huh. and I'll win. But you know, maybe that's true, maybe it isn't. But I feel like I need to protect myself. You know, I can't ever say in certain books like, oh, the feeling was electric if they don't have electricity. You know, you, so I have to just really try to stay in that culture and in that time. And so I don't read any fiction. I spend a lot of time reading people's unpublished dissertations, these weird reports, scientific, with this book, a lot of scientific studies. And then when a book is done, I just go on a big reading rampage. And I read everything. I read mysteries. I read 
the, you know, whatever the big new books are on the bestseller list. I always try to read the first novels by Asian American writers. I read a little bit of science fiction. I just, I try to cover the waterfront because it's all interesting to me. And, and you know, a couple of classics I'll throw in there, which all of this I did last summer when I had a break. And I actually made a list that I included some of the books in my newsletter. And even I was like, wow, that's pretty eclectic. That's a, that's a, that is an yeah. eclectic reading list. Mm -hmm. Well, in this book, older women are greatly respected. Yes. They are absolutely honored on the island of Jeju. And as a matter of fact, the Jeju word, which is Hamang, has two meanings, grandmother and goddess. The Island of Sea Women, it is wonderful. Lisa C., I want to thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having thank me. Thank you. I'm Ann Bocock. Connect with me and join me on the next Between the Covers.